Okay. Kia ora and uh, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the uh, Global Partnerships team and the Auckland Conversations team, I bid you a, a warm evening and a warm um, welcome to this evening's Auckland Conversations. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed. I'm the General Manager of the Auckland Design Office, um, and it's my great pleasure and privilege to be tonight's um, MC. Uh, this evening is um, about engagement, excitement, inspiration, and uh, tonight's conversations are about trying to get out into the public domain, having conversations with Aucklanders about matters and issues that are affecting the city. Um, tonight's um, guest has flown in all the way from uh, New York, Edith, and we're going to look forward to uh, introducing her to you in a, in a few minutes. And it's great to have you, Edith, here. Thank you for making the trip. Uh, I know you're a busy lady. So um, Edith will talk to us about the challenges facing um, New York, particularly Manhattan, where she's the director of uh, planning. But tonight's really also about understanding the opportunities and issues that are facing Auckland and to see whether there are similarities and things that we can draw from, from those, those cities and to make some learnings in terms of moving forward. So to all of you tonight, thank you for turning up. Um, there's about 800 of you here this evening, which is uh, fantastic. And uh, it's just great to have the conversation happening across the region. It's great to be engaging with the community of Auckland. So tonight we're going to be uh, engaging in a, a range of ways. Um, we'll be joined with a, a small panel discussion at the end of, the, of Edith's presentation. So I just before we get into that, I'd like to just send a very warm welcome to two very cool people. One is to John Duguid, who's uh, a general manager of the Plans and Places Department. John's going to be joining me uh, as a panel discussion a bit later on. And also to Adrian Young Cooper. Adrian is a uh, director on the Hobsonville Land Company uh, at the, currently and uh, doing some incredible things with the Crown. So they'll be joining us up on stage with Edith to talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities facing Auckland. Um, before we move on, I just want to make a very big thanks to uh, the councillors um, who've turned up today and local board members, particularly um, uh, Councillor Chris Darby, who's the chair of the planning committee, um, but also to uh, Pippa Coombe from the Watamata local board, but also Councillor Denise Lee, who's going to be giving the vote of thanks towards the end of the evening. So thank you for turning up and being part of this conversation. It's really important that you do, and thank you for your support and ongoing support. So just a few housekeeping issues before we get cracking. Um, as I said, I'm sort of the hors d'oeuvre and Edith is the main course. Um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, um, an alarm will sound and will be directed out of the building by the ushers. Uh, the bathrooms are located near the bar uh, to the back of the, of the auditorium, uh, which is on the left as you leave the room. And finally, please could you turn all your mobile phones off uh, so we don't get interference with the um, broadcasting because we're actually broadcasting this live, not sure to who, but to the world. Um, and it's really a big part of the, the New Auckland Conversations program whereby we are videoing and filming these conversations and they are available live um, around the world. So there'll be people from all over the place uh, tweet, um, turning in. If you, for those of you on Twitter, uh, there will be a range of uh, Twitter handles which will pop heavily, hopefully. Um, tweet madly and let's kind of create a Twitter storm about tonight's conversation. So look, putting on all these important talks um, and engagement conversations would not be achieved just with sort of ratepayer money alone. This is a big program and uh, I just want to make a particular um, call out and shout out to the private sector teams and organisations that get behind us every single time to help us bring these to you. And so particularly our sort of overall sponsors who are Rosine, uh, would you mind putting your hands together to thank them very much? Rosine have been with us for many, many years, and it's uh, great to have them supporting us continually. Another big thank you to some great friends who are developing up a, a, a new relationship with us as program sponsors. So they are Brookfield Lawyers, Boffer Miskell, Architecture Designers of New Zealand, the New Zealand Institute of Architects, the New Zealand Planning Institute, and the New Zealand Green Building Council. Some really critical players and actors within the urban development realm. So thank you to all of you for your ongoing support. So in terms of the agenda for tonight, what we'd like to do, what we're looking forward to this evening. Uh, the format will be a presentation by Edith, um, and then followed by a panel discussion with our panellists, of course. 
Um, in between that, what we'll do is, as Edith sits down after her presentation, what we'll do is we'll ask both John and Adrian to speak a little bit about the projects they've been working in, uh, the issues that they're challenges that, and issues that they are facing within their particular areas of work and perhaps reflect upon the presentation they've heard uh, from Edith. So it'll be a way to, to introduce them to you but also to stimulate the discussion. And then I'll be taking some questions from the floor once the panel discussion has, has ensued and finished. And uh, the Auckland Conversations feed, so that's the hashtag AKL Conversations feed, that will be monitored throughout the whole night and we'll be able to hopefully bring some questions through that um, process too. So if there's opportunity, we will do that. So look, on to tonight's main course, um, if she's ready and, uh, and willing. Uh, um, our special guest tonight is uh, Edith Su Chen. She is the fantastic planning director for uh, the borough of Manhattan uh, for in New York City. Uh, we've had a long and a new and blossoming relationship with New York City, and um, that, that song was for you, um, to welcome you here. The last sort of um, New York guest we had was uh, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who uh, was here for a week and uh, involved in lots of conversations like you have been over the last 24 hours and will be tomorrow as well. And uh, we've got a really growing relationship there, not only at, at officer level, but also uh, with the, um, at the senior um, sort of mayoral level, which has to develop over time. So um, it's great to have you here as well and to continue that program. So look, since 2008, Edith has, um, has led the office, which has been responsible for planning, zoning, and urban design public space management and land use related activities across the New York borough of Manhattan. She is a key advisor to the New York Planning Commissioner and provides guidance to the Deputy Mayor in terms of housing and economic development issues. Edith specialised in incentivising the private sector to deliver public amenities such as public space and transit improvements. Edith has lectured at the Harvard School of Design where she also graduated with a Masters in Urban Planning. She's also a frequent panellist um, at urban development and design conferences. Um, there's a much longer CV, but we'll get into the conversation and expose that as we discuss it through, this, through the session. So I'd like you to put your hands together and welcome Edith. Wow. Well, thank you, Ludo, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the council and uh, for inviting me to be a, a guest speaker at uh, Auckland Conversations. It is a thrill and an honor to be here. Um, I've only been here two days, and I'm telling you, I'm already in love with Auckland. <laughs> it's not every day I can open my curtains and I can see volcanoes and harbor, 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 harbor. Every, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, but I don't even have a chance to be homesick because there are also some great reminders of New York City for me here. I see a lot of similarities. Um, immediately I was blown away by the multiculturalism of the city and uh, the mix of the old and the new in, in your physical uh, built environment. And there's a very strong sense here of we're not done and we are as aspiring to do more. And that's definitely a, a sensibility and ethos that we have very much so in, in Manhattan and, and in New York City. Um, of course, we've got more in common, um, maybe not so readily apparent, but we can certainly feel it. You can feel the energy. Um, we are growing cities, Auckland and New York City. And uh, with that comes challenges, certainly. Um, but with those challenges come opportunities. And it's up to all of us to step up. And are we going to grab these opportunities and uh, start to innovate and start to find ways, new ways maybe, or new old ways of accommodating this growth? Um, before I go into um, the projects I wanted to talk about tonight, I just want to say a little bit about uh, New York City. Although you may all know this already, I've, I find New Zealanders to be so incredibly well-traveled and so knowledgeable about the rest of the world, which I can't really say about Americans. Um, okay. So New York City, uh, as you know, is the largest and most populous of American cities. Um, it, we're made up of five boroughs, uh, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, and Brooklyn and Manhattan, and Manhattan, we are the smallest of the five boroughs, but we are the mightiest of the boroughs, we like to say. Um, our population in Manhattan is 1.65 million, which is about the same as Auckland, maybe a little bit more, um, but believe it or not, we only occupy about 5% 
of the landmass that, that you occupy. So you can imagine the, the density of, of our population on, on the much smaller footprint. Um, New York City, um, overall, our population is about eight and a half million people, a little over that. And we are very, very proud of our diverse community. Over 38% of New Yorkers uh, were born abroad, including myself. I was born in Taiwan. I believe that makes me authentic cousin to the Maori. Very excited about that. Kapai, I hope I'm saying that right. Kapai, Kapai. Um, we speak over 200 languages, and uh, we represent over 100 nationalities. By 2040, we are going to be beyond 9 million people. I mean, we've been growing so quickly. Since 2010, we've already added the entire population of, of, of the equivalent of Wellington. Um, and in just 13 more years, we'll be beyond 9 million. So again, growth poses challenges. You know, in particular, ch the particular challenges that I've been focusing on and the Department of City Planning have been focusing on is housing, where are people going to live? And affordable housing, you know, can the housing be accessible um, to, to all? Um, there's also questions of infrastructure capacity. Um, when uh, Mayor de Blasio came into office, he uh, was already anticipating this growth and at the outset of his administration um, established a comprehensive plan called New York City, One New York. And this was a plan for a sustainable and equitable city that addresses the social, economic, and environmental challenges ahead. And he established um, questions um, to which there were uh, measurable goals that we were trying to achieve over the course of the next decade. And he put 72, 72 city agencies to work on over 200 initiatives. And where does the Department of City Planning and I, as the, uh, a planner for Manhattan, fit in all this? Um, again, just to look at Manhattan, you, you all know it's an island. We are an economic and cultural powerhouse. We house many Fortune 500 companies and new companies. We incubate lots of new businesses, and uh, we are home to amazing educational, medical, uh, cultural institutions. But we are also a borough of neighborhoods. A lot of people live in, in Manhattan, and we want to make we at the Department of Planning want to make Manhattan, continue to make Manhattan a great place to live, work, and play. So um, the challenge to us is, you know, how are we going to accommodate this growth? You know, we are looking to, uh, we are creating what we, what we believe are bold new innovations in planning and zoning. And you know, I remember when I started out as a city planner 20 years ago, when I said the word zoning, I, would, I, I could see eyeballs literally going back into skulls, like, oh, zoning is so boring. But zoning is actually an incredibly powerful tool to get what we want. It's a powerful tool of the public sector to leverage the private sector to deliver public amenities. And we've gotten so much more sophisticated with zoning over time. In the beginning, you know, when zoning was first established many decades ago, it was quite a blunt tool. We said, okay, let's control bulk use and density. And now we're doing all sorts of very clever things with zoning. Um, the three projects I want to talk about today are um, Greater East Midtown, Hudson River Park, and East Harlem Neighborhood Study. And within the context of my talk of these three projects, I will talk about some new tools of zoning. And in particular, um, how, we're, um, uh, how we're stepping up our engagement with the community, with the, broad, with the broad stakeholder group, and how we're looking to them to do a lot of pre-planning work in advance of our planning work. Um, and we'll, I'll also talk about new tools and new mechanisms to get dollars into, into, our, into the public coffers, and these dollars are coming from the private sector. Okay, so let's start first with Greater East Midtown. GEM, the gem of New York City. Uh, we, we like that acronym. Um, the purpose of this rezoning is to ensure the long-term strength of East Midtown as a premier world-class business district. This is the area that's anchored by the majestic Grand Central Terminal. It has uh, the Chrysler Building, the Sony Building, the Seagram's Building, the AT&T Building. I'm, I'm sure you know, you, you know those buildings. This is the midtown of Park Avenue, Lexington Avenue, Madison Avenue. With all due respect to Qu Queen Street, this is what we believe the best business address in the world. 
in the world, and we want to keep it that way. Um, just, let me just show you uh, on a map where Greater East Midtown is. It's east side of Manhattan, um, and uh, it, it spans uh, about 78 blocks. Um, it's got incredible cachet of old and the new, and, and we like that. We like that character. Um, there is over 5.6 million square meters of office space. All this red indicates commercial, commercial use in the district. So you can see it's an incredible commercial district. Uh, there's over a quarter million jobs here. Um, it is an, it's a very powerful tax base for New York. This area alone uh, accounts for more than 10% of our commercial real estate tax, tax, role, tax revenue. Um, it is, of course, home to the iconic buildings I talked about a moment ago. And it's a regional transit hub because of the presence of Grand Central Terminal, which was built just slightly over 100 years ago. Now, the foundation of East Midtown strength uh, is based on the fact that the area is so accessible by transit. So Grand Central Terminal is not only a regional transit terminal, it's also a local subway station. So every day, we see over 600,000 trips and transfers coming through uh, Grand Central. Um, and the public, we continue to invest billions into the infrastructure in this area. Um, we are uh, opening up a new regional train, sta uh, train station coming from Long Island, so coming from the east to Grand Central Terminal. We're opening that up in about 2022. And the uh, Second Avenue subway, which uh, uh, the uh, first leg was just opened earlier in January, um, it will give an option to east side subway riders, um, and it will give some relief to those coming into this district. So East Midtown has a ton going for it. You know, the vacancies actually are relatively low in this area, and there's still a lot of cachet and visibility and recognition of this area as a great CBD, but we know that there are long-term challenges. There are challenges to this district that could uh, pose um, a threat uh, to, to its long-term viability as a world-class central business district. And let me tell you a little bit about these long-term challenges. Number one, the aging office stock. The average age of buildings in this area is over 75 years old. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's just that the bones of these buildings uh, aren't, the, aren't the best for, for today's modern tenants. You know, these older buildings have low floor to ceiling heights and they have forest of columns inside. And that's not the kind of space that, uh, that most modern tenants want. Um, and we love mix of uses, but we're seeing a lot of these older buildings flip to other uses, hotel and some limited, excuse me, some limited residential. We love mixed uses, but we do not want to fail on capitalizing on the investment in infrastructure. We want to make sure we maximize our tax base. And this is a great place to work because of all the transit. Um, so we want to make sure we keep this area commercial. There's been very limited new development because this is an older central business district and so much of the land has been accounted for. There's, this is built upon. Um, there are, there's a lot of congestion on the streets and sidewalks and in the subway station. A lot of blister points where people are just, you know, rubbing past each other. They, they, they just want to get to work or they just want to get home. But, you know, some people, I, I like to call the daily commute into um, East Midtown the, the daily salmon run. So you're trying to get up these stairs, you're just trying to get to your office, and it's just hard, you know. Um, and then there we have a public realm that you know, it's a little underwhelming. I think we can do better. Every world-class central business district has a world-class public realm, or should have a world-class public realm. And then the zoning. The zoning that we have in place is really outdated. It does not allow for enough density. And um, it frankly isn't doing enough. We're not demanding enough of the private sector um, for, in the zoning in this area. So, you know, we've known about these issues for several, several years. Um, in fact, we tried to do something about East Midtown. We tried a rezoning for East Midtown during the previous mayoral administration, uh, during uh, Mayor Bloomberg's time. We couldn't get the ball past, you know, the, the, the end, into the end zone. Um, and for a variety of reasons. Um, and it was a real shame because we knew everyone, there was consensus that we have to do something for East Midtown. Um, when Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio was then the the uh, mayor-elect, he committed to taking a fresh look at East Midtown, a fresh look at a new zoning, a new planning process for East Midtown. And um, 
you know, I, we all recognize that there was not enough buy-in the previous time we tried this in 2013. So we're going to have to do something different. So the something different was to look to the community, to look to the stakeholders, and have them give us their recommendations first before we come out with the plan. You know, what are the hopes and dreams and expectations of the key stakeholders in this area? And we looked to the elected officials, a count, local council member, and to the borough president of Manhattan to lead a steering committee. And the steering committee only had 12 members, 12 groups, and it was quite varied. It include, included labor, it included community boards, you know, a volunteer group of people who dedicate you know, their time and energy to uh, talking about you know, major land use issues in the area. Uh, we included a civic group, we included the real estate board of New York, we included landmark, uh, landmark uh, heritage advocates. So it's quite a varied, uh, uh, quite a broad range of stakeholders. But we thought we needed to hear from everyone. And um, our co-chairs, uh, the Manhattan Borough President and the council member, they did a fantastic job you know, ushering this process. It was an intense one-year process where they went through a number of issues, you know, historic resources, land use, implementation, public realm, transit improvements. And at the end of the process, at the end of the, state, the steering committee's planning process, they gave us, the, the city of New York, an incredibly impressive uh, uh, document which had recommendations for what we should do in East Midtown. And we took these recommendations very, very seriously. They took their job very seriously. And you know, this was not about um, crowdsourcing you know, what, what is a popular thing to do. This was, you know, I mean, and I'm not opposed to crowdsourcing. I think uh, Bodie McBoat, what is it, Bodie McBoatface is one of the best things to come out of, you know, the internet. But, you know, we really wanted a, 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 a rigor and discipline, and, and we got that out of the steering committee. And, um, you know, so when we got their recommendations, we used it as a springboard, as a solid foundation for our planning work. Um, you know, we look to this consensus-driven document, and you know, it, to to advise to advise us. So we believe that uh, we were off to a great start because we had this community input very early on um, into our planning process. And uh, our proposal was is very faithful to the spirit, if not to most of the letter of their recommendations. Um, you know, the, our proposal in the end. Um, it, it, it's an as-of-right development framework, which is a very good thing for the development community, right? And it really increased as-of-right density, in some cases almost double. In, in, in Manhattan, Central Business District, in this area, the FAR, floor area ratio, the multiplier, your maximum allowed floor area is generally 15 times your lot area. Um, in, some, in, in our proposal, we allowed it to go all the way up to 27 FAR. That's almost a doubling of the FAR. This is really great news for the development community, right? Uh, but what do developers have to do? Ah, they must do their share. They must do their share. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, excuse me, you know, every world-class CBD has a world-class public realm. So what is their contribution? Okay, well, um, there are three ways a, a site can achieve more floor area. So you don't just get the floor area for free. The developer doesn't just get it outright, free and clear. They have to earn their way to this increased floor area. So number one, they could do transit improvements. They could just go right into the subway stations, you know, working with the Metropolitan Transit Authority, and they could make improvements to the subway stations, to the mezzanine, to the stairs, to, you know, you name it. Um, and they get credit for it, and that credit is floor area. Um, number two, you could actually uh, purchase development rights from, unused development rights from area landmarks and move it onto your property. So uh, here's a little graph of, you know, moving the, people say air rights, it's not really air, it's actually development rights, right? You're moving it over to um, a development. But guess what? We get part of that. We get part of the value of that increased density. So in our case, we propose that we get 20% of that increased value, and that money goes into something called the Public Realm Improvement Fund. 
And mm -hmm. same thing for rebuilding, this is a little bit more technical, but in, in New York City, um, in, in this area, we have a lot of buildings that are built beyond the 15 FAR maximum, and that's a big disincentive to refresh a building, to take, to take down a building if you can't even achieve your old FAR. Let's say you had an 18 FAR building and the, on the books were saying you can only do 15. You're not going to take your building down and lose those three FAR. But that was the past, and now we're here. Now we're trying to innovate. And we're saying, yeah, you can have it. You can have it back. You can have your three FAR back. But part of that value, you've got to contribute into this public realm improvement fund. So we're going to get a lot of, we're going to get a lot of money into this fund. Um, and this fund is going to do a lot of things. Um, you know, we're expecting hundreds of millions of dollars to go into this fund over the course of a couple decades. And uh, we're, we want to invest in the public realm. You know, these are just some ideas. I know, Auckland, you guys are doing amazing work in your, in your streets. Um, you know, so we want to pedestrianize some plaza. We, we already have some of this work underway, of course. Jeanette Sadakan did an incredible job, um, you know, getting this to be a, a, a great, a, a, an embraced concept in, in New York City, taking back the street for pedestrians. Um, maybe we'll have some shared streets. I've seen some really nice shared streets in Auckland. Um, and also just doing some bull bouts and some traffic calming. And this is money that we didn't have before, right? The public said we didn't have it. We're, we're not taxing anyone. We're not increasing taxes. We're just we're getting it out of out of p private development. So we're very excited about that. And of course, there's all the transit improvements that that could be uh, handled through either the developer just does it or um, the fund will pay will pay for it. And we know we feel very confident that this is going to work because we are we already have a very successful test model. Um, before we embarked on the Greater East Midtown proposal, we did a smaller rezoning of a smaller area within East Midtown, and we have a project that was already approved and is already in the ground. This project was approved in uh, 2015, and it's already a big hole with lots of work un underway. Um, uh, this, you know, this large building here, I don't know if I have a pointer, but, you know, obviously the one next to the words, um, it's going to be 120,000 square meters of brand new office space. Uh, this is what we need in this area. We need super class A modern buildings. And uh, it's a very tall building, but look what, we got over $225 million worth of public realm and trans improvements at the same time. That this developer is providing. This developer is providing because essentially this developer got a doubling of, of what, what uh, it could do today, what it could do prior. Um, so there are you know, on-site, off-site transit improvements, and there are on-site and off-site public space improvements. And so we're, we're very excited to see this project underway. It's, it's a construction site. It's very exciting. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, for our Greater East Midtown proposal, again, for the overall 78 uh, block area, um, at the, uh, what we expect to see to come out of our planning process, our, out of our uh, plan, assuming and hoping that it gets approved later this year by City Council, we'll see 16 brand new office towers. Um, we'll see an increment of over 600,000 square meters of office space. We'll see 28,000 new jobs. We'll see hundreds of millions of dollars into the Public Realm Improvement Fund. And we will see billions of dollars of new tax revenue. The one Vanderbilt building alone per annum will deliver $50 million of more tax revenue. So that seems win-win to us. We're very happy about that. OK, so another project um, uh, for which we have been very demanding of the private sector um, and not unfairly so, I <laughs> think, is uh, a new zoning special district for the Hudson River Park. Um, the Hudson River Park, if you're not familiar with it, is a seven kilometer long park alongside the Hudson River, extending basically from the southern tip all the way to 59th Street. It was established in 1998. It is a joint collaboration between New York State and New York City. Um, and it is the second largest park in, in, in New York City after Central Park. It is um, an incredible uh, resource uh, for not just for the neighborhoods immediately adjacent to the park, but really for the whole city. It's, it's got you know, a, a ma a wonderful amenities and um, it's a beautiful park. Um, but you know, not all of it is doing so well. There is uh, a pier called Pier 40 that provides a lot of recreation space in particular for soccer, or I think I'm supposed to say football, <laughs> um, and um, other sports. 
um, and it is going, it is it's severely deteriorated. And there's just, there hasn't been enough money allocated to it from, from, from the state or, or, or even from the city, you know, so where, how can we um, really shore up this incredibly valuable resource uh, for, for the city? So, um, you know, in 2016, so just last year, uh, propelled by the severe deterioration of Pier 40, which actually was threatened to have to shut down, and, you know, hundreds of kids who play, you know, actually thousands of kids who play soccer there would have to f go somewhere else or n not play ball. Um, you know, what we did is we established a special district that would allow for the transfer of unused floor area from the park because there were certain commercial piers along the park that actually does ha that do have development rights. Uh, the state had preceded us and, 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 and adopted an act, a legislation, to allow for the transfer, and then we followed the state to uh, create new zoning that not only allowed for the transfer, but also was very demanding of the transfer. So, um, oh, so our first project, uh, which was just approved in December, half a year ago, um, it, it, what it did is it moved, uh, two, I think, 200,000 square feet of unused development rights from Pier 40. You can see that big square over there on the water. Moved it over uh, the West Side Highway on onto um, a site called Saint, formerly Saint John's Terminal. It was a warehouse site. And the result is the approval of a, a new mixed-use development called 550 Washington. So the developer was granted a rezoning from a manufacturing district to a mixed-use district, a commercial district that allows for residential. Um, and as part of that special permission, um, the developer is required to make a contribution to the Hudson River Park Fund. Big contribution, $100 million. $100 million to fix Pier 40. Um, and uh, an extra special thing, so, uh, I should have shown this slide, this is, this is uh, one of the, this two towers out of one, two, three, four, four towers that would be allowed at 550 Washington. Um, in the case of a residential development on the site, which, which we anticipated, because it's just, it's a great site for, for brand new residential units, 30% of the units are required to be affordable, 30%. And, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the building also includes indoor public recreation space and, and public access areas. So again, through zoning, we were very demanding of, of, of the developer. And, you know, the developer, you know, they're going along. They want this, you know. So we know this is not an unfair deal if the developer is coming along with us. Um, so we're, we're very uh, proud of this um, pro project. And we have more opportunity to, to do the same, to do more of the same. Um, and just further north, um, we have this entire city block, Block 675. It's just south of the Western Rail Yards, which you all may know as Huts, part of Hudson Yards. It's, uh, there's been a lot of development on this side. This side doesn't look like this anymore. Um, and there are a lot of unused development rights at Chelsea Piers. So there are three big properties on Block 675. And out of those three, and those three big properties, they all want the same rights to you know, uh, build a new commercial, uh, commercial or residential uh, floor area, and we will go through the same exercise of making sure that we get, you know, uh, contribution to to the to the park fund and uh, affordable housing. Okay. Okay. So the third uh, project I wanted to talk about is our neighborhood study in East Harlem. Uh, so now we're going uptown. Um, the major focus, excuse me, the major focus of the current administration, the De Blasio administration, is housing. In, in particular, affordable housing. Right now, our city, like yours, um, we're in the midst of, of, of a housing crisis um, with demand far outpacing supply, and there's a growing gap between household income and household rent. And uh, this is, a, it's a very serious issue and something that we, we, we must address right away. Um, when uh, the mayor came into office, um, he put, uh, uh, his deputy mayor, uh, Alicia Glenn, and Department of City Planning and the Department of Housing and Preservation to task on coming up with a, a vision, a housing plan for New York. So we've got a five borough, 10 year plan. And the main elements of this plan is number one, we've got to create more affordable housing. And we actually put numbers to this. We said we, we want at least 80,000 new affordable units. And uh, we've got to improve the zoning to promote uh, not just affordability, but also the quality of the design. Um, number two, we've got to preserve 
affordable units. There were a lot of affordable units that were coming out of the, you know, the, the, the roles of rent stabilization or other programs that help keep rents low. So we, we need to preserve a lot of those. Let's preserve 120,000 of those units. And uh, we need to help protect tenants, you know, facing harassment. And, you know, we need to strengthen rent, rent regulations. And then the third um, leg of, of, the, of the three point, the, the tripod approach, was to make sure we plan and invest in strong neighborhoods. So it, it's very important that we collaborate with the community in which we are doing rezoning. Um, and, and we would create neighborhood development funds. We're going to put our money where our mouth is, you know, where we're going to uh, make some changes in neighborhoods by, by changing zoning. You know, we're, we're going to support um, the neighborhood with other, other needs, not just zoning. We're not just going to go over there and zone and change the zoning, but we want to make sure we invest, make capital investments in, in other um, neighborhood needs. Could be schools, parks, you know, streets, in, you know, other infrastructure needs, so, uh, social services, et cetera. Um, one of the major highlights to come out of our efforts in uh, implementing the housing plan was just last year, uh, the city of New York adopted its first ever mandatory affordable housing regulation. Um, it, is, it is not the first ever in the United States, but it is the most aggressive in the United States. So in our mandatory inclusionary housing plan, where developers are enjoying an uptick, a significant increase in development capacity, we are demanding that we get at least you know, 20 to 30% of that as affordable housing, permanent affordable housing, permanent. So no matter how many times the, the building changes hands, those units will forever be permanent. Um, and you know, what, what, what we had to do is we have to identify areas in the city in which we can apply this mandatory affordable housing regulation, this mandatory inclusionary housing regulation, because again, our framework is really only valid when there is an uptick, when there is a significant increase in, in uh, development capacity. So we've identified seven neighborhoods so far in the city of New York where we can apply MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we're, looking at, we're looking for areas where it makes sense to increase density. We're not going to do it just because, you know, or, you know, throw a dart at a board. You know, we're really, we're looking, we're looking hard for areas that maybe hasn't, in, hasn't had much zoning attention, where we see there's been underachieving development, where, you know, there, there are, there, there's not enough being, um, there's not enough attention, you know, to these areas. Because we can do more than zoning. We can also deliver other capital investments and improvements. So we've identified two neighborhoods in Manhattan um, for which we're, where, we, where we can apply um, uh, MIH, and one of them is East Harlem. So East Harlem, very big area, a 96 block area in, in Upper Manhattan, um, just east of Central Harlem, and basically east and, and northeast of Central Park. Um, it has a very rich cultural and social history. It's made it the home of choice for a number of immigrant groups over the years. Um, but again, this area has not gotten much attention um, from city planning in the past half, half century, really. Um, it's really long overdue. Um, it's a little bit about the profile of East Midtown, um, excuse me, East Harlem. Um, the, uh, there's a 30% poverty rate in this area. And there's a higher percentage of uh, Latino and African American residents than, than in the city overall. 45% uh, of the population um, it depends on uh, some sort of income support. Um, and there's a higher, much higher rate of asthma, obesity, heart disease, and, um, and uh, premature uh, mortality. So, you know, there are, other, there are many issues to address in this area, not just zone, zoning. Okay. Um, housing, what's happening here in East Harlem, like all of Manhattan is pretty hot. You know, there's just only so much floor, or only so much land to go, to, left to go. And so there is current real estate pressure. But what we're seeing is that Buildings are getting built, um, but they're all market rate, you know, because existing zoning doesn't demand that much. It, um, so it's allowing these buildings to go up with only market rate buildings and sometimes luxury buildings. And it is fueling, this, this, this kind of real estate activity is fueling the, feels, the, the fears of gentrification. So we want to we want, we want do something right away. Um, you know, we had already launched the East Midtown Steering Committee process, and we thought it was very successful. Um, this project is, is, is a, about a, a year 
uh, staggered, not, not quite a year, staggered after the East Midtown proposal. But we said, let's, let's try that model of the community steering committee here too. And um, so Melissa Mark Viverito, uh, she was, she's been an amazing leader on, on the steering committee. And she assembled uh, project partners, so she's also partnering with the Manhattan Borough President, the local community board, and a, um, a, a local civic, uh, an activist group, um, Community Voices Heard. And she brought together about two dozen, maybe a little less, 21 groups um, to participate in coming out with their recommendations to the city. Their, you know, their, their planning framework, um, you know, to deliver to us, and they went through a very intensive year of a lot of meetings. I mean, it was very disciplined. It was, I mean, this work is really incredible. I mean, the people dedicating, you know, their nights and weekends, you know, to convene and talk about a wide range of issues. Um, and it wasn't just a steering committee. I mean, they, they did they did meet very regularly, but they also opened up certain sessions to the broad, to the community at large. And we had over 1,500. East Harlem residents come to various public uh, visioning workshops. Um, there were over, you know, over, I think there were close to uh, 50, uh, 50 or 70 meetings over the course of the year where the steering committee met and were super disciplined. And um, the work, you know, they covered a great deal of subjects. You know, they, uh, they talked about open space, recreation, schools, safety, transportation, health, small businesses. and. Uh, after their intensive year of work, um, they provided over 200 recommendations to the city of New York um, on, uh, on, on these 12 key topic areas. And you know, we can't do everything. We can't, we can't do it all. Um, but we at least know what our priorities are in the community. Um, and it's been an incredibly helpful tool for us as we shaped our, our, our plan. Um, Oh, sorry, just to, for a moment. Um, the steering committee, they had three main objectives when it came to land use recommendations. And that was, um, number one, please preserve important East Harlem buildings and, and reinforce the character. Number two, and this was, this was huge, allow for increased density. Allow for increased density and select places to create more affordable housing and spaces for jobs. And so it was, it's, it's very reassuring to hear that the community itself is, 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 is okay with that. They're okay with increased density because it means more housing. It means more space for you know, economic endeavors, for commercial endeavors, for jobs. And uh, you know, also, the, you know, third, you know, please improve and create more services and amenities for the community through new development on public and private sites. So th these are all very, these are very good, you know, use, this is useful, very, very good guidance for us. And, uh, you know, we took all their recommendations, the city, we convened, you know, our own, you know, crack team to get going on this. And the city coordination's been really phenomenal, like coming out of city hall, you know, city planning, we're a lead agency on these neighborhood plans, because this is what we do. But we've been working so closely with the other agencies, with transportation, the housing authority, education, small businesses, you name it, you name it, Department of Health. And um, we've come up with, uh, you know, a rezoning proposal um, where we are targeting certain, you know, streets for more density, um, certain streets for more housing, certain streets for more mixed use, certain streets for, you know, more uh, uh, highlighting, really emphasizing this area's potential for uh, to be a regional transit hub and to be uh, an amazing regional central business district. You know, we've done all this because we've got, we've gotten some great guidance from the community and you know, we are planning professionals and so, you know, we're using our own expertise of course too. Um, and as you know, the plan is not just about rezoning though. We at Department of City Planning, that's what we're focused on. We're looking at the zoning, um, but we are working with the other agencies to make sure that there's a huge there's an overall package there's a package that goes more than, that, that's just more than zoning. We can't go to a neighborhood and say, we're gonna upzone you, thanks, bye. You know, it's really important that, that we provide, you know, uh, you know, an overall package and we, and we hear what's important to the community. Um, so again, I, I mentioned this already, we had, this is not big, you know, a, a sledgehammer like approach to the zoning. We really looked at each corridor, where we should focus housing, where we should focus, um, uh, you know, preservation. 
you know, we're, this is not just about upzoning. We also uh, identified areas where we think the, the scale should be kept lower, where maybe there should be a height limit, you know? And so it was nice to have that, that balance too. And I think, I think everyone appreciated that we weren't just all about, you know, upping, upping the density. Um, the Second Avenue subway is also part of this plan. Yeah, Second Avenue subway is coming. You know, it, it still may take decades, um, but we are we are accommodating for its expansion and growth into East Midtown um, by making sure that you know uh, we we build it into zoning in advance. So we're not, for example, we're not going to penalize developers for providing space for a vent shaft or an entrance to a subway station. So this we can build right into zoning. Um, I mentioned earlier that East Harlem has the potential to be uh, a regional commercial district. It certainly does. There is a regional rail station here in East Harlem. This is, uh, if anyone's a little bit familiar with um, Harlem, this is 125th Street and Park Avenue. This is the, uh, the, the, the shed over the regional rail, rail station. You know, we believe density belongs at transit. That's a great place to put density. So we've actually, uh, uh, we're proposing a new, new zoning envelope, a new zoning densities um, to allow for, for the new uses here. And there's also going to be um, a base requirement for commercial floor area. First, you have to provide a certain amount of commercial floor area before you can provide residential um, because we think that's, that makes the most sense at, at a regional um, train station. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there are some there are some other areas of East Harlem that are um, you know not appropriate for intensification. Um, there's a there's a really you know beautiful sense of you know there's a lower scale you know here in this case we've got a row of beautiful brownstones, and so our proposal sh also includes preservation strategies. So you know in this case you know we're providing a maximum envelope you know basically the maximum box in which you can put a new development, and that's shown here in in the blue dashed. So it's um you know a multi a multi prong approach, different approach. Um, uh, in, the re, in the rezoning, and at the end of this all, um, after the, re, the rezoning is approved, touch wood, um, you know, it's expected to spur, to, to create over 3,400 new units of housing, um, over 11,000 square meters of commercial uh, space, uh, new stores and new restaurants, and, uh, oh, excuse me, 25, over 25,000 square meters of office and industrial space and uh, uh, new stores and restaurants. And, um, you know, we're very excited about that. So, so those are uh, just, you know, a handful of projects that, uh, that we're working on right now that include within them some new tools of how to get more from the private sector and how we also have to deliver more. So it's not just about you know getting from the private sector. Like we're demanding more of ourselves to the public sector. So you know we're it's our our plan our neighborhood plans are not just about zoning anymore. It's a comprehensive full spectrum of 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 uh, of public goods and amenities, and um, we're also you know making sure that we contribute financially. You know it's this is an important thing to do. So we are creating a neighborhood development fund for each of these neighborhoods that we're going into. So I think you know my message overall is, um, it's 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 good to be bold. It's good to reach you know far and and and, and high. And uh, you know I think every 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 major city is, is, has these challenges, right? These growth challenges, and uh, it's a really important time for us to be ambitious and to be aspirational. Um, there's no harm in that, right? Um, and I, again, I do, I do feel and sense th this camaraderie between Auckland and, and New York City. And I've I really enjoyed the past two, two days, I've only been here two days, learning about uh, what, what you've been doing. And I hope to learn more about what you're doing. Um, and I promise I will be an ambassador of Auckland when I go back to New York City. So now, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you. Well done. Awesome. Thank you, Edith. That was that was fantastic. I um, get yourself a glass of well, some water there, just to settle in. We're going to give you a bit of a break for ten minutes or so, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, bring up a couple of my, my colleagues to be part of the panel, and we're going to give everybody a little bit of sense of, of who they are. But just perhaps as a quick sort of reflection on what I just heard, it is particularly about there are so many similarities. The scale 
of things are different. Of course they are, but cities are quite similar and because ultimately cities are about people. And the issues are very similar. The, the conversations around NIMBYism and so forth are not in my backyard, but, but actually NIMBYism is just real people with real issues and they're fearful of change. And so it's really interesting. I think we need to think about how we engage, and I think that's a, a big piece of the piece. But one thing I wanted to reflect on was your point about the yawning around the zoning, which is interesting because I think that, that planning does need to change and does need to step up. Uh, it is complex. Cities are complicated, and it requires great skills. And I just was thinking about the type of planning that we needed, um, more professional, um, more commercially savvy, um, more innovative, more practical. As, as you, know, there, you, need to be, you need to have both, uh, more collaborative, um, and be current, and also reflect the community you serve. And I just suddenly thought, you know, you're, you're a... You're a wonderful ambassador to all those things. So I think you, you provide a great sort of, um, sort of role model for that type of conversation. So I think that's important. So therein lies the opportunity for planners to be more central to that conversation and lead it, as you said. So that's my observation. So what I also was reflecting on was we have a little, an island called Waiheke Island, which is one of the most extraordinary places on Earth. But thinking about scale and density, you could fit Manhattan on Waiheke Island which is not what I'm proposing, but the point... <laughs> I'd seriously lose my job. I, he's lost it. He's been drinking again. Um, but what I would say is it's just around utilising land more efficiently and more carefully. And you have done that in Manhattan because the land is, is finite. And so it's about working more smartly. So there's another theme that, that comes through. So look... Whilst we have a little break, um, I'm going to invite up um, my colleagues to uh, come and talk to you. As they come up, so John and Adrian, do you want to join us on the, on the stage? I'll talk a little bit about Adrian first. So um, Adrian Young Cooper um, is the, has been the chairman of Housing New Zealand um, for the housing, New Zealand Housing uh, Corporation since August 2015. Um, Adrian also served as the uh, deputy chair of the Auckland Waterfront Development Agency, and so we worked uh, really closely together for many, many years. Um, she also chaired the Hobsonville Land Company Limited for five years. And um, if you all know the Hobsonville Point uh, development uh, initiated by the, the previous Waitakere City Council, I would believe is, what, and in conversation and in partnership with the Crown, is one of the best projects in New Zealand in terms of interdisciplinary, multi-agency um, funding and um, operation. And I think it just becomes this benchmark and uh, there's a question in there uh, for later. But she now remains as the director of, of, the, of the land company. Also, Adrian served as a deputy chair of the Auckland Regional Transport Authority, which she replaced, which replaced Auckland Transport. So a huge background in not planning, but delivery, but also transport. Um, for those of you that don't know, but Housing New Zealand is the New Zealand's largest social housing provider with over 60,000 homes across the country under management. Uh, the government recently announced its largest home building program in the last 50 years. That was just last week, and we can talk a little bit about that um, uh, as we move forward. But it's the biggest uh, housing building program in the last 50 years. And the Hobsonville Land Company and Housing New Zealand uh, are going to be leading that portfolio. So they lead that portfolio and that conversation um, in Auckland in terms of delivering affordable housing and also uh, general housing. Hobsonville Point is just 20 minutes drive northwest of Auckland city centre and is now a very short ferry ride away, which again is also part of the, the choices that we need to do. The scale of development is very significant for New Zealand. Um, a decade from now, Hobsonville Point will have 4,500 homes and its harbourside location and character-rich streets will be home to more than 10,000 Aucklanders. So Adrian is going to talk a little bit about the work that she's been doing, the pieces of delivery that she's been involved in, and then a few reflections on the, the link to what she's heard from Edith. So, that's, um, so next up would then be John Duguid. 
John is a colleague of mine in the Chief Planning Office, uh, led by uh, uh, Jim Quinn, who's the Chief Strategy Officer, who's here tonight as well. So it's great to see you here tonight, Jim. John is the, has been a planner for about 20 years now. He, um, he was the lead planner for the former North Shore City Council and has worked and led on projects such as the Albany Centre Development. And prior to the formation of Auckland Council in 2010, he was the Auckland City Council's planning manager in downtown Auckland. During that time, John's team was responsible for progressing changes to the planning rules for Wynyard Quarter. And again, um, Edith talked about the sexiness of zoning. I mean, it doesn't sound sexy, but without John and his team doing the plan change, we wouldn't see Wynyard Quarter that has developed down there today. And understand the details of zoning and planning and the rules and the tools, again, we wouldn't see Wynyard Quarter in the way that it is delivered today. So planning is bloody key. Um, so more recently, John has had a really challenging role, <laughs> which is probably one of the biggest kind of guess, career highlights of your time, John, which is leading alongside Penny Pirrett the, the new unitary plan. And um, he's also currently the general manager of the Auckland Council's Plans and Places Department. John is a passionate planner. Um, he's a great supporter of urban design and also understands the importance of planning in terms of creating vibrant economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable communities. So those are your two um, extra sort of colleagues and, and partners for the, the panel conversation. So John, um, who's up first? Is that you, John? Are you ready? So you've got some slides as well, haven't you? So do I click that on for you? Let's hope it is you first. There we go. Right. Thanks, you've got about five minutes. How does that sound? <laughs> Planning history, go. All right, so uh, good, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you. What a, what a build-up. <laughs> and um, what a hard act to follow. Uh, Edith, that was um, fantastic. I, had, I did see your slides yesterday, but um, great to hear you actually talk to them. So I've got five minutes, roughly, <laughs> to try and draw some links between the bold planning in Auckland that's taken place in the last five, ten years, and some of the um, themes and projects that you've talked about, Edith. So here we go. Let's see how I, I go with that one. So look, who are we in Auckland? Um, this slide here really just talks about us, you know, in terms of our population, almost 1.6 million people now in Auckland. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with that. Um, the other key thing there, 39% born overseas, um, which, just talking to Edith before, I think 38% mm -hmm. for New York City. So we've got some parallels there, but in terms of the population, much smaller than New York City as a whole. And I just did some quick um, planning geek maths before, um, Edith, um, with New York City as a whole, I think you said about 750 kilometres squared. The urban area in Auckland is about 1,000 kilometres squared, slightly bigger, but in terms of population density, obviously far, far lower here. I think it's roughly about eight times the density New York City relative to the urban part of Auckland, let alone including rural Auckland. So some big differences, but I think some key commonalities as well. Edith talked about the sort of the one plan for New York City as a whole, a one plan, the Auckland plan, about five years old now. Many of you will be familiar with its key themes, but you know, pretty bold at the time, the compact city approach, the 70-40 split that you might have heard about with 70% of Auckland's growth ideally within the existing urban footprint, so that's a much denser city, picking um, up on some of the New York City themes around upzoning and intensification, and we're all pretty familiar with that conversation. In Auckland, as it unfolded and continues to unfold. So that's our Auckland plan. It's going through a bit of a refresh at the moment. Um, so you'll probably hear about, more about that over the course of the next uh, year or so. But some strong themes around the importance of the city centre, uh, some expansion to the north and to the south and the greenfield areas, but really building on our 10 metropolitan centres, the Albanese, the Takapunas, the Manukau city centre, the Hendersons, the Newlands and so on, where some great stuff's been happening. But what can we do uh, to leverage more out of the investment, uh, public and private, in those locations. So I guess my key project, along with many, many others, uh, and I certainly don't try and take any credit for, for it, because it was a huge, huge effort by not just council staff, but um, all of Auckland to really um, get their heads around what this uh, unitary plan might be. Edith, for your information, it's, it's basically it's like a, a zoning plan for the whole of the region, but it also has a whole lot of environmental and heritage type controls in there too, so it's pretty comprehensive and it, it does very much pick up on the Auckland Plan theme of providing more capacity for housing in the right places, but also preserving the places that Aucklanders value for the history and, and their environmental um, qualities. So that's the, um, the unitary plan basically was a, was a huge exercise. We have it now in place. It's, it's 
pretty much operative and fully enforced. There are a few appeals that are holding some things back, but we'll get there pretty, pretty soon. And um, yeah, some of the development opportunities are certainly being taken up, including by House New Zealand. You'll hear about that shortly from, from Adrian, but many, many others are starting to see the possibilities under the Unitary Plan, but it's not all about capacity and growth and intensification. It's also about protecting, as I said, the qualities that Aucklanders value about Auckland and good design. Another key plan from my point of view, um, and I certainly had very li limited involvement in this plan, but it was the City Centre Master Plan. It came out shortly after the, um, the Auckland plan came out, so roughly 2012, 2013. You know, I think it's a very bold plan. It did build on much of the thinking that happened prior to that, but it, you know, some of the key, um, key things that the City Centre is grappling with, um, this is a nice little graph here that shows that the significant increase in residential population. I heard before that that uh, 2030 estimate of 45,000 residents, we're almost there already in 2017. In six months, that's the estimate. So this graph is well and truly out of date. So at the time council was formed with the amalgamation, we're roughly 25,000, we're, we're up to 45,000. So big change for the city centre. 60-odd uh, thousand students, that would have increased as well, and 90,000 workers. So yes, the city centre is important. Um, and the City Centre Master Plan has some really big, bold moves about stitching the, the, the core of the City Centre into the waterfront, um, about uh, the, the sort of eastern and western sides of the City Centre being stitched in, and also st stitching, using that word again, but really connecting the City Centre to its fringe, Parnell, Ponsonby, the Newton area. Huge opportunities there to get greater connections, more walkable pedestrian connectivity, and also public transport. I won't go through all of the big moves, other than to move in very quickly to, um, I guess, some of the success stories. Shared space in, uh, in Auckland has been a real success. I think places like New York City would probably acknowledge that we are, you know, blazing a bit of a trail, setting some great examples with um, some of our shared space. And that stat's probably out of, out of date as well. 10% increase in foot traffic on Elliott Street. I suspect it's far more than that. So there's an ongoing... Uh, public space improvement program in the city centre funded through a targeted rate, so different funding mechanism, but um, there is that dedicated fund to continue to roll out some of the public realm improvements in our city centre. Um, so where are we off to next? The waterfront. Um, some great stuff been, that has been happening there over the last five, six, seven, ten years. Um, at, at, the, at the most, really, it's been a pretty rapid transformation of the waterfront, but particularly in the... Um, I guess the flagship Winyard Quarter area. Uh, Luda mentioned that I previously had a role uh, in terms of taking the zoning changes through to take from an industrial area into more of a mixed-use, vibrant place that we're starting to see today, and that's been picked up by Panuku, our CCO, and some great stuff happening there. I guess one of the key thing, themes here is around, you know, uh, public ownership of the land uh, made a huge difference. If that land wasn't owned by the public through ports of Auckland and regional holdings and then onto the public of Auckland, uh, we, we wouldn't have seen that transformation in qu at quite the same rate. And I guess the investment in the public realm enhancements, the pub public realm improvements, um, big public investment, but you can just see now the unprecedented private interest and development happening at Wynyard would not have happened without that upfront public uh, commitment um, to be the catalyst, I guess, for the transformation of Wynyard. And as we all know, it's a place that Auckland does starting to really love and enjoy. And I was sort of casting my mind a bit back a bit further. It's, it's not too long since the, the Britomart development is, is only about um, 10 to 15 years old in terms of the, um, the original master planning, the development agreement. Really great example um, of a, a good, solid public-private partnership enduring with strong heritage um, preservation, restoration, um, public realm improvements, spaces, and, and, and the key one, of course, is that um, bringing the train station right in underneath Britomart all of that is only just over a decade old. So there's some pretty bold stuff has been happening in Auckland. And so if you move outside the city centre, we've got those 10 metropolitan centres in our town centres. Just some very quick examples of that um, public-private um, investment. We have Newland here with the um, changes to the, um, the rail, brand new rail station, um, library, civic space, and you get uh, a developer, I think it was Infratil, uh, going in there and, and doing a, a decent, uh, pretty high-density development to really... Um, start to transform uh, New Lynn. And then down in Manukau in the south, again, the investment up front in the, the infrastructure with the rail um, extension connecting in there, and then MIT seeing that as a huge opportunity to really um, bring 
the student population right down in, and that's, this is probably a fairly unique example globally of a, a train station embedded in the heart of a university, both developed in sync at the same time. Probably are other examples, but that's a, a fantastic one to start transforming um, Manuka. And so, just to conclude, um, New York uh, City, this is one of your most, uh, I guess, famous um, recent, um, you know, uh, spaces that's totally transformed. Um, and I guess while we don't have too many disused rail tracks in Auckland, like the High Line, High Line in um, New York, we do, of course, have our very own um, light path, Tiara Efiti, um, as an example of just taking a piece of disused infrastructure and giving it a new lease of life with the pink um, walkway, cycleway there. So, talked about for a long time in the city centre master plan, just to bring sort of bring it back to their planning, um, and now a reality. So, I think I've hopefully given you a bit of a link for the conversation between Edith and Auckland. Thank you. That's great, John. It's uh, difficult to uh, run through the planning history of, of uh, Auckland in five minutes, but you did a did a great job. So, look, next up is Adrian. Adrian really is here. Um, to provide a, a, a sort of, I was going to say private sector, but, but she has. But primarily she's speaking tonight on behalf really of the, the Crown sector, the property development component of, of the Crown work. And um, Adrian's going to give a sort of sense of, the, of her perspective on what's underway with the Crown projects. Um, it's great to have her inside the tent, um, and uh, we work closely together for many, many years. So she's going to talk a little bit about the progress underway, the big challenges, and also reflect on some of the um, learnings from NYC and the work that Edith has been up to. Adrian Young-Cooper. Uh, well, it's actually it's, um, fantastic to be able to um, come out from a huge um, load of planning. Um, so I'm the third planner. Um, but um, I'm at that stage of my career where I'm pretty interested in doing and implementing. And so that basically um, is the work um, that I'm very involved with. It's an incredibly exciting time for Auckland. There's just the most incredible transformation going on with huge projects. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them. But actually, it's like all change. You know, it's really, really painful. Um, you've got to actually do um, a lot of, um, you know, digging... Ding sticking up of things and a lot of disruption of communities, a lot of disruption of places, um, you, and we're actually doing things that people haven't seen before in Auckland in the way and the places that we're doing them, and I think this is going to be a little bit of a theme, um, I think, for the next four or five years until we just get used to the fact that things are changing, and it's really wonderful that there's this huge body of Aucklanders who are so interested in what's happening in our city. And it's really critical that you are advocates and you are, you know, you're out there and you're champions for this change, even though it is painful. It'll be worth it in the end. We'll have a much, much better city. So, look, in terms of New York, um, just so if I could actually reflect, I'm lucky to have spent a lot of time in New York City, um, on just on uh, basically holidays, and I spent two um, two weeks there um, in last September, and particularly in this area of Midtown. And one of the th and I'd I'd add I, I really notice the pressure of population, which sounds a bit silly because I have been there before, but actually it was palpable just how many more people were in New York, and you felt it initially from the fact that this the uh, the, the sidewalks were just so crowded it was really hard you just had to go with the flow. Um, it wasn't a good place if you wanted to wander. It was not a good place if you're a bit older. It wasn't a good place if you basically had to lift your feet um, because actually the, the pavement below you was quite broken. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that you do what you're doing in terms of getting that investment in the public realm. And I'll come back to that, back to that theme. The other thing that I really get from um, New York, which I think is a lesson and it's a really important part of you know, the future of Auckland, is that New York is full of different kinds of apartments for everyday living for everyone. Um, so New Yorkers don't even think about it. And sure, you can live in a house if you go way out in the suburbs or upstate New York. But basically, you know, this, the, the central, central part of New York is just full of apartments. And actually, Auckland's transformation is on the way to an urban city. It's not all about apartments in the central city. It's about actually apartments everywhere. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. 
So um, Hobson Vaughan Land Company and Housing New Zealand um, are part of the Crown family, and we're certainly pay, you know, playing our part in terms of addressing more housing for Auckland. We've been working on Hobsonville Point um, now for about 10 years, five years of planning and five years underway, uh, almost 1,000 houses built there now, but it takes a long time. The planning is now getting faster and faster and faster. We have been working on the Auckland Housing Programme, which is a very ambitious 10-year programme um, with Housing New Zealand for about two years, um, and we are already underway with the implementation. If I talk about the Auckland Housing Programme first, we had to actually analyse every last piece of land that Housing New Zealand owns in Auckland. It's not a just um, a theoretical um, exercise, and we have had to say, what is the development potential? We then had to do all this work with the unitary plan, and thank you, John, um, for the wonderful result that's been delivered uh, through that unitary plan. It's a start for the transformation um, of Auckland, and it has given significant capacity for increased housing, uh, particularly in the areas of um, highest demand within the existing urban areas. Um, so we've been working on this. We've got our first four years of the Auckland Housing Programme uh, very much uh, underway. We've got a lot of our resource consenting has already been done. Uh, we've got a lot of our contracting uh, underway, and you'll start to see, and you're starting to see in the newspaper various discussions of various developments. Um, there are also um, developments uh, um, all around Auckland all starting to actually happen. In terms of some of the suburbs which have got relatively high densities of housing New Zealand um, homes, we are actually taking the Hobsonville um, point approach and we are doing integrated master planning. The first one that has been talked about a lot is Northcote and that is well underway and we've already got our first housing underway there as well. Um, and we have uh, Akarana in progress um, and are still working on the master planning for that and there are um, quite a few more where we've started to do our initial work. By June 2020, we expect that we will have delivered or enabled our first uh, 6,700 homes of social, affordable and general market. And just turning quickly to Hobsonville Point, uh, hands up people in the room who have not been to Hobsonville Point. Okay, well, um, there are not that many of you. Um, for the rest of you, could you go back? <laughs> because it basically changes every week. Uh, and, and there is just, we, we have been saying we've done a lot of work there. Basically, we've got 4,500 homes to be delivered there. We've got almost 1,000 homes complete. But the really interesting thing is that actually of the ones still to come, we've got over 1,000 apartments. Now, this is a master plan community. Nothing happens there by mistake. Everything has been thought through. Uh, the mix of community, the mix of household types, and actually that integrated development, working with both the, the land development and also the housing development, is actually very complicated and takes a lot of resource and it takes a lot of working with the private sector who have stepped up pretty amazingly um, to really a whole new kind of development. Um, I do want to just, um, uh, in my, my, my closing point, my big idea, I know you're going to ask us about, but I'll just give a little bit of a... Um, a little bit of a flavour of it. Going back to the theme of apartments, we hear, you know, about apartments. They're so convenient, you know, lock up and leave. Well, actually, apartments are not for locking up and leaving. They are for living in and staying in and actually building in terms of communities. So we have to start thinking not about an apartment development. We've got to think about start thinking about communities which have got lots of apartments in them. What that means for the community? What kind of you know? What kind of amenities? What kind of streets? Um, what kind of things can we do that basically create a different kind of community? And I think we can learn a huge amount from New York. Um, because you wouldn't say that New Yorkers were shorter community. Thank you. Very good, thank you. So we've got a good snapshot there of a range of, of uh, different scenarios, different issues, different projects, and also different personalities and different players and actors. One of the things that um, I wanted to ask you, Edith, probably first, is to talk about, we talked about change today, and everyone's brought it up. Um, everybody wants progress, but nobody wants change. Mm -hmm. And so managing change 
is one of the critical pieces of, of planning of cities and also of councils. And I suppose so the question to you is, in terms of your experience in New York City, you talked about engaging the community in a different way. It's difficult to engage the communities. They are often more busy doing other things. They don't vote as much as they used to. How did you engage communities? And what was the, the biggest factor of success in terms of enabling change in your program? And probably I'll ask that to, to my colleagues as well. So Edith, you're up first. Does this work? Yes. Well, thank you for that question. And thank you, John and Adrian, for your presentations. And I, I keep, I'm just nonstop absorbing. I'm, I'm loving all this. Um, it's, uh, Adrian, you mentioned the pain of growth. And I, I certainly did not mean to make it sound like what we're doing in New York City is easy. It is very painful. It is, you know, change, people don't like change. You know, even in, in an island where towers are everywhere and prevalent, we still have people who don't want more towers. You know, they may live in a tower and they don't want to see another tower. You know, it's, it's hard. Um, but how do we, uh, you know, how do we get people more comfortable with the change and with our new model of community engagement? We have looked very, very strongly and directly towards community leaders um, to help us with that. Uh -huh. And um, we have, in two cases, in the East Midtown, East Harlem proposals, we looked to our council member, our local council member, to lead the steering committee in partnership with uh, the borough president or with other identified you know, key leaders. Um, but you know, we, we can't do this ourselves. And um, the community obviously has, you know, they, they've, they've put someone into office. They've elected someone who they trust and believe can help deliver the change. They actually put these people into office because they, they, they want to see change. Absolutely. So they're the, they're the change agents, right? They're change catalysts. So um, we were partnering. We're doing much better partnership with uh, the city council members. That's, that's one way we're doing that's it. That's a super, you know, a super simple way to... You know, that's what they're in for, that's what they were voted for, and um, getting them involved. I guess the challenge with planning, isn't it? It's a sort of a, a long-term yeah. kind of concept. Politics tends to be slightly more sort of political and therefore based on terms. And so uh, how does the planning survive the journey? Uh, and how do the politics stay the course of that journey is a challenge. I just wanted to add one more point. You're yeah. talking about the journey. Um, I think in the past, the mistake that we have made was that we waited too long to include the council, to include the council members. And they do have a formal role in our land use review procedure. They have the final say. The city council can adopt or disapprove um, a rezoning. And they are the last step of the, of the, of the, man, of the um, official land use review process. But we've kind of flipped that on its head. They're still the last say. They're still the last word. But now we're including them way, way early. Even before we start our, our rezoning proposal, we are consulting with the council members very early on. And we are leaning on them heavily to help us um, understand you know, what are the real specific hope and dreams and expectations of the community. That's fantastic. Great answer. So how about I ask um, Adrian and then John to just comment on the sort of the big um, what have you done within Hobsonville to kind of create that sense of change, that expectation? What was the way forward? Is that working? Um, is this working? Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, look, can I just take another example, which is uh, when, we, when we go into, um, say, an area like Northcote, which is an existing area where people live. Um, one of the things that we, that we do a lot is we, act, we go, with our social housing tenants, we actually have got a fantastic tenant team and they go door to door. There is formal communication, but they actually go and talk with people um, and try to give them a lot of notice about what's happening and when it's happening. Yep. Um, and it's just, a, and, but it's while we're thinking about it, before we've got to the stage of starting to do master planning and those kind of things. Um, it seems to me that you cannot communicate enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, um, that seems to, um, there doesn't seem to be anything <laughs> that's got enough in it. Um, and I think that once we start hearing back that we have been over-consulted and you're talking to us too much and can you, we know what you're doing and we know who to get hold of when anything goes wrong, um, we'll know we have actually succeeded. We haven't had that yeah. yet. There was a, I remember a, um, 
a friend of ours who was a, uh, she works in the, in the, in, for Y&R, Young and Rubicum Advertising Agency, she said, on message over time at volume. And once people are bored of you, then it's, you've done your job. And I think that that needs to be done. Uh, but to be smart as well in terms of the conversation and, and talk with the language of the people that you're serving. So uh, thank you, for Adrian. How about you, John? How about sort of change management in terms of the, the plans and the projects that you've led? What's been a big takeaway for you or success, I suppose? Oh. Or challenge, even? Change management. Well, I was going to just pick up on the theme of um, engaging yeah. uh, our communities. And um, I guess, you know, key words that spring to mind are patience and hard work. You've got to be really patient. There's a lot of hard work involved. Um, you know, my biggest ex experience was with the unitary plan process, and it was just relentless, you know. To try and get the voices of uh, Aucklanders that you wouldn't normally hear from was the biggest challenge. So there are many Aucklanders that you hear from quite frequently, but that's, that's you know, that's not all of Auckland. So... <laughs> There not was always the, the ones you want I, to hear, I think there were some successes. I, I wouldn't want to pinpoint exactly how it happened, but it was hard work by many people, our councillors, um, deputy mayor, staff, networks, some of you here as well, to sort of get the voices of Aucklanders who wouldn't normally participate in planning to be heard. Um, and there are many reasons why they did eventually pipe up, and they were heard. So. May I just take a moment to salute John getting the unitary plan through, I, I cannot even fathom uh, doing a statutory plan for an entire city. Um, that must have been just Nor a we. huge <laughs> undertaking, okay? He has scars. Huge, okay. we, we said it wasn't possible, but others didn't listen, so. <laughs> which is a good thing. Good. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a huge undertaking, and, um, and also, you know, we've been talking about, I mean, Adrian, on this other side of the fence, uh, we're sort of public organisations, your crown, but you also have worked in the private sector. Um, the unitary plan, all the 13 unitary plans, were a nightmare. If you're a private sector and you're trying to invest or make a decision about X, Y or Z investment, you know, you need some clarity. And so John's team, uh, with, with Penny Pirrett and her team and the councillors and the community, got one plan for a whole region, which is a big deal. They'll be tinkering with that, and, um, but it heads us in the right direction. It's now getting the other parts of the jigsaw puzzle working. So talking about other parts of the jigsaw puzzle, um, just thinking about not-for-profits and philanthropists and funders and so forth. I mean, last night, Edith, you met up with uh, Generation Zero. You know, do you have... These guys have been pretty important in the, in the, in the change, the behaviour change conversation. They are also the future. How, how did you find them? And, and what, would you have versions of that in New York? Because I bet you do. We have versions, but boy, was I super impressed by really, yeah. Generation Zero. Incredibly impressed. And, you know, I met with uh, probably about eight members of, of the group. And I cannot believe the savviness yeah, yeah. Of, of Generation Zero and how effective they are in getting their message and building bridges and getting, you know, their, 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 uh, their message across by, uh, you know, probably make, making visible partnerships and probably making some behind the scene partnerships. Yeah. Um, they're truly an outstanding, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're very impactful. And I wish we had more of that in New York City, actually. But we do see the younger generation mm -hmm. being much more active. I'm so encouraged by millennials. I think millennials actually get a bad rap in, in media. Um, you know, I feel that, uh, number one, the future always wins, right? Like, there's no point fighting it. The future is always going to win. <laughs> and the future is smarter than, 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 than we are. And... Um, you know, it's wonderful to see the, the younger generation. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're already part of, they already believe in the share economy. A lot of it's because they've had to, because, you know, it's, it's you know, things are, housing is expensive, everything's expensive. You know, there's a different attitude uh, towards um, ownership and, um, and quality. They demand high quality and they also believe, I think that there's a, an ethos of sharing and that, is brought into city planning and, and views of the city. I love that sense of, of uh, collective ownership and responsibility of our city streets. And you know the streets don't have to be for cars or just for cars. Yeah. Um, it can be for multi-use, it can be for pedestrians, it can be for bicycles. It's, it's, uh, it's a really great thing to see. And I, I'm seeing that in New York as well, but it was wonderful to meet with the Generation Zero. They're so focused. And uh, I think Auckland's very, I think there may be a new, it's a New Zealand group. Maybe it's beyond Auckland, I'm not sure. But it's I don't know, actually. I think it is New Zealand group primarily, yeah. Yeah, very impressive. 
they've been really critical with a bunch of things like the unitary plan conversation, mm -hmm. the, the the loud few against mm -hmm. the the silent majority, but they became a majority. Um, Sky Path is a cycle path yes. over the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Yes. We would never have got that over the line without them. And also, there's other groups, you know, transport blogs and so forth, who are smart, savvy people who want a better city. And um, yeah, we, we are lucky. <laughs> And um, we can't rely on them always to right. be the last sort of line of defence, though, and that's the frustration at times. So right. it's about getting the conversation happening earlier. But um, I, I suppose just the, the same theme, Adrian, how are you engaging with the, the sort of younger communities which are going to be looking for new types of housing that you are trying to build? Are you building the right homes for the future without knowing what the future will bring? How do you mix it? Uh, how do you, what's the mix? Well, I think, you're, I think this is one of those occasions I say that's a very good question. <laughs> um, but I would, I would actually observe um, at Hobsonville Point, which um, I've done that thing and have um, voted with my capital and gone oh, to live you? there. Uh. Um, one of the things that I love about it is that it's full of young people. Um, and there are lots of conversations and the community is very connected with Facebook and so I sit there and actually observe a lot of, com a lot of conversations amongst people about how to live in a much more dense built up community. Um, so look, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm actually taking part in the experiment yeah. um, and so far it's, um, it's going pretty well um, but it's, and people are very, very active in terms of how they want to form up this new community. They seem to, I mean, people haven't had the choice of a planned um, terrace house type typology um, over, you know, d sort of dozens and dozens and dozens of, of homes, the little pocket parks and those kind of things where it's been thought about at the beginning. It's not something you've actually had the opportunity of doing before in, yeah. um, in New Zealand. Um, you had to have your quarter acre section to have a bit of open space. And so people are learning how to actually um, share these communal spaces. There's a lot of learning going on, but we all talk to each other. So we ask each other. And we talk, you know, and, and the youngsters, they all talk to each other. And they tell me. <laughs> so thank you. That's, oh, John, I'll, I'll let you off that one. You'll probably come back to it in a second. But we're going to break out to a few questions from the floor um, as we do that. So who, who's first? Who's got a... Um, I'm just trying to struggle with the... The, um, where's the ladies with the other uh, lady right at the other uh, lady right at the back? Is there a, is there a microphone? Um, just as we come to you, madam, um, I was just thinking what I think there's, as a rule, a super rule, which would help, is every developer that built a home had to live there for two or three years, almost like a, a golden handcuffs. Because I think that's that's practicing what you preach, and I think there's a lot of developers that would never live in some of the product they build. So I think that's perhaps a little rule we could write into the, the new unitary plan, John. <laughs> Lady at the back. Um, I have a Hello. question for Edith. You talked a lot about housing affordability. What does that mean in terms of numbers to purchase and or to rent? That's a very good question, thank you. Um, when we talk about affordability, we are keying uh, the rents to income. So in the case where a developer is required to provide, let's say 20, 25% affordable housing, um, that housing has to be available to a family that makes 60% uh, of the area's median income. And in a case where a developer uh, is providing 30% affordable uh, housing, um, that affordable housing must be available to uh, families of three that make 80% of the area median income. Um, so, you know, it, we key it to, to, to income. Um, I don't have the exact numbers uh, in my head, but that, that's, how we, that's, how we, that's how we designate. That's how we under, that's, how, that's what we say, what we mean by when we say affordable housing. And, and that's kept in, you said mentioned it, sort of kept as affordable for, for in perpetuity, is that right? Absolutely. How long, can, so how long is perpetuity? I mean, it's, it's a... Well, it's like forever. Not, so it, it just it, it, so it keeps it keeps it affordable for a period because that's often yes. the, the challenge is you you buy an affordable unit and then you flick it on and you you then it doesn't become affordable anymore. So it's 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 levers of how to protect it. Yes, we we're, we're absolutely trying to stop this uh, trend where you know units are required to be affordable for a number of years. Sometimes it seems like a very long time. Thirty years sounds like a long time, but there's a family living in there when that you know, alarm goes off, ding, 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 
time's up. Yeah. It's no longer affordable unit. So we don't want that to happen anymore. So when we are um, requiring affordable units, we really mean that these are forever. And um, you know, it, 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 we, we've done it already, and so we, we know that it works. Um, we haven't done it to great to as great extent as we're doing it today, but there are there are some projects that have done the perpetuity and, and they're successful. Okay, great, thank you. John's going to just yep. jump in a if bit. If I can John. just break the protocol and just jump in here with a question for Edith. So we tried that in Auckland through the Nutri Plan, and the, and it's gone. It's not. It didn't survive mm -hmm. the the process of submissions and a hearing and so on. Uh, and the fear essentially was that it would just put push the prices of the remaining units or dwellings higher. So. How have you dealt with that? Have you heard that argument before? It was exactly the same method, in perpetuity, at a price fixed to average incomes, um, but the fear was that that would simply push the, the balance of the dwellings up. So yeah. that's... You know, yeah. we, heard, we heard that argument. We did lots of economic analysis. Um, it take, we, took, we, we took apart, you know, all that analysis. And, you know, the market, the market rate units are they're going to be what the market rate units are. And, you know, it doesn't seem... We, we found that people are still going to rent them. They're still going to go in them. Um, and uh, it's, we're really... We're, our economic analysis bore out that even providing this 20 to 30 percent was not going to kill the project. But we are very protective of that 20 to 30 percent. You know, some people criticize the city for not being more aggressive, for not demanding 40 or 50, 75, even 100 percent in some cases. But it, the more we demand, the more um, infeasible the overall project becomes. So we believe we've hit just the sweet spot. This 20 to 30 percent makes the project still, it's still viable. And it doesn't it doesn't crush you know the, the the overall project and make the market units, you know, too expensive. Great question. So there's a I think Graham. I can't see Graham. Hi. Um, I just want to challenge a comment that was made by Adrian. She talked about there'll be apartments everywhere. No. I think that's the wrong language to use. Um, even if you built say 40, 50,000 apartments, that would only be 10 percent of the housing stock in Auckland most people would still be living in the conventional houses or maybe the sorts of um, apartments and things that we've got used to, the low-rise things. I think the word that needs to be used, because you've got to sell the politics of this to people and not spook them, is talk about choice. So you, you, Hobsonville is excellent. It's drawing lots, of, lots of, of people. It's an alternative way of living and people are getting it. But for those who don't want it, they've still got the choice of remaining with, with what they have. So you've got to be careful that you don't uh, oversell the proposition. Uh, I, I think the work that's happening is, is excellent, but it's just you've got to get the, um, the, the political acceptance with the, the masses, otherwise uh, you'll find them voting in politicians who believe in different things, and then, then we might not get the outcome that we really want. So we've got to take the people with us by talking the right language. Couldn't okay, I just, want to, I just want to correct the impression that I think we should have apartments everywhere. Um, I think I said we needed apartments in our suburbs as well as in our central city. Um, they are actually, and I agree with you, it is actually um, a choice. The unitary plan has been incredibly powerful um, in enabling uh, parts of the city to be redeveloped um, for terrace housing and apartments. And it's a really, really important part um, of our growth story for Auckland that we're actually able to take you know, some of these very beautiful parts um, of the city from a location perspective and we can have more people for the same footprint um, and we will actually have a really, really interesting city with more people and uh, more interesting communities. That doesn't mean to say the houses aren't still going to be there. Of course they're going to be there. It's all in, in the unitary plan. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's a lady in the middle at the back there. Is there anybody to get, get a microphone to her? Great. Hi. I just had a question about um, what difference do you think it makes having a population that's focused on home ownership versus an acceptance of um, renting long term? And what role possibly the tenancy, the strength of the tenancy laws play in that? Who's that question to? Um, all the panellists. Who wants to go first? It's a really important question. So, anyone want to pick it up before I? 
Uh, Dive well, in there. <laughs> I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, I think that it's, uh, but there has been a lot of conversation uh, being led and debate being led. Again, I think it's Generation Zero about having higher levels of security with respect to tenancy. Um, and I think that we do need some, some new models um, in this space. So that doesn't mean to say, um, so I don't have the specific answer. I, I know that at Hobsonville Point, again, um, we are actually trialling a particular development where you can lease uh, for between five and seven years. And that particularly is to enable people who perhaps want to go there and put children through a school um, and actually have a longer tenure. Um, so that is a, that's a product which is being developed. We don't know if people in the market are interested because, of course, the value of, of tenancy is that you can, you know, you can come and go. Um, and the value of ownership is that it's sort of yours um, so long as you don't want to sell it. Um, and, um, you know, so, I mean, everything's got its, got its value. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's good. Um, what about, I mean... Is there a perspective from New York around a rental? Because, it, you know, it, I was in Seattle last year and Google, Amazon, they're all there. Those people don't want homes. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to move. And if we're going to compete for those people, we need to provide something for them. They don't want to be tied down, in right. effect. So right. they're, they're highly mobile, highly wealthy, but they can be anywhere. So what about New York? Are you having a similar conversation? We're mostly focused on rental housing. Right. That, that's really the demand okay. in New York City. There's the mobile workers, and it's also really for the affordable housing um, push. You know, uh, home ownership is usually way, way, way down the line. You know, first you just want to be able to find an apartment you can rent that you can afford. So we've been mostly focused on, on that. Um, it, okay. it hasn't really... Uh, it, when, we, when we're doing our planning, we, we, we are thinking more about rentals, and um, we have, you know, we, we, we've got more work to do when it comes to uh, home, home, affordable home ownership opportunities. Yeah. I think that requires more work for us. Okay, that, that, that's, that's great. Let's, let's have one more question. Um, does anybody want to... Uh, Luda, who's shouting in the back there? I can't see you in the darkness, sir. Sounds like Mr. Ray, okay. Floor's yours, Alistair. Be um, prepared. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's great to hear what you got to say about um, zoning, Edith. And um, it sounds like maybe in summary, um, you're effectively selling up zoning um, for the public benefit or maybe capturing the benefits for landowners of up zoning and then bringing that to the public good. Um, we've just up zoned, as we've heard from John, um, huge areas of the city. Um, and uh, I guess, um, and, and I've got a feeling that we've not really captured the, the value of that. And I, so a comment to you, uh, ask a question to you, Edith, as to whether you think that's a missed opportunity, but also maybe an opportunity for John to say um, whether, whether you think we've captured that um, value somewhere. Well, uh, number one, I appreciate that you're using the word capture versus sell. <laughs> so that, that is what we are trying to do. We're trying to, uh, we do a lot of value capture incentive zoning in New York. Um, and uh, I don't know to the extent of, of uh, experimentation um, and, and I'm hearing that it's, it's not part of the unitary plan. doesn't mean that it can't be part of a unitary plan or a future plan. Um, it does take a lot of buy-in, and, um, you know, it, certainly it can, it can be started at, in smaller increments. Um, but it's been a very, very powerful tool for us, uh, a very useful tool to help you know, amplify our coffers. Um, I don't want to say there was a missed opportunity, because I think the unitary plan is, uh, has accomplished many other things. Um, you know, it has identified areas for intensification, and that is a huge achievement in and of itself. Um, so maybe the next, the next generation, the next innovation for the new unitary plan could be experimentation with value capture. Uh, essentially, our legal framework doesn't allow for it. Mm -hmm. So the unitary plan is produced under our Resource Management Act, which does not allow for value capture at all. Local Government Act, I'm not an expert in it, but I think there'll be some challenges there. So it really is a, a, a council uh, central government discussion that needs mm. to take place if, if that tool is a, um, a tool that we want to use in the future, and I think it potentially is a good part of the solution. There really is a discussion to be had with our government to, to give us the, um, the legal ability to mm. capture that value. Yeah. Just to perhaps uh, provide a, a another point on that is that John's right, and, uh, but the tool is, is able to be used. 
and we have a new organization called Panuku Development who are there to facilitate and, and drive development. But we also have two key projects. One is the City Rail Link, which is this um, on three underground stations in the central city, but that, that's for the entire rail network. Mm -hmm. So the value capture is along the entire rail route, not just downtown. Mm -hmm. But we constantly get into this debate about 2.5 billion and, or 1.5. It's not about the urban regeneration potential of the city rail link. It's the wrong name of the project almost. It's, a, it's more than that. So that's one thing uh, to say. Um, it is complex, but it needs the right people who've done it before. Everyone talks about it, but not many people know how to do it. And um, it is a, a tool which we need to use. $225 million on the um, one project. One project. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're all mouth-watering at that. Mm. And yet we seem to allow the private sector to say, no, we can't afford that. But actually, mm. says who? And I think your point about economics is where planning and economic needs to work together. So I think that's a great question, Alistair, as, as I thought he'd do. He'd do. And uh, something for the future. So I think... That's been a really great conversation. It's difficult to manage it across the, a large room like this with uh, three very diverse but actually very similar concepts of, of city planning. I just want to thank, um, firstly, John Duguid, my colleague in the Plans and Places Department uh, from the CPO. I'd also like to thank Adrian Young Cooper from Hobsonville and from Crown. And last but not least, uh, Edith, for her fantastic input tonight. And thank you for coming. Thank Would you mind putting your hands up? So before we go tonight, it's a really important piece of the conversation is a, a vote of thanks from uh, one of our senior politicians in the organization. And we talked about the politicians. They are the ones who make the decision at the end of the day. We provide them with best professional advice, and they can make a call um, either way. So we're very lucky tonight to have Councillor Denise Lee here tonight. Uh, Denise is the deputy chair of a a new committee set up under the, the new mayor, uh, Phil Goff, um, which is led by Councillor Chris Darby. So Chris is the chair. He's here tonight as well. Uh, but Denise is going to give the vote of thanks. I, I don't want to go for a long sort of spiel on your CV, but I do want to say that um, Denise is the, is the as I said, deputy chair of the planning committee. She's also the councillor for Mungakiakia and Tamaki, um, which is in Auckland as well. Um, Denise is interesting because... She's been a really passionate supporter of the Urban Design Programme and um, one of the things that we did a few years ago was my team and a whole range of volunteers went out, undertook a, a Jan Gale public life survey and um, there were lots of councillors that put their hands up as well but Denise did as well, spent five hours with me, the lucky lady, and uh, counting people, observing what they do, observing public life and we spent lots of time together. I really, it was a really good moment and um, it's really good that you've come here tonight and given us your time. So, um, Denise Lee would like to give the vote of thanks and good night from me. It was a good moment, Ludo, a five-hour moment. <laughs> um, every positive event deserves to end on a positive note, but they're not going to be my words, they're going to be yours. Um, when you get elected, you have to, especially when you're in governance, you have to um, handle two concurrent streams, risks and opportunities, and which stream do you think gets the most airing? It's always the risks. So on a positive note tonight, let me just recap a couple of words here. Edith, you said great places to live, work and play, bold new innovations, powerful tax base, world-class public realm, 28,000 new jobs, great guidance from the community. We can do more than zoning, we can deliver capital improvements. And my two favourites, I promise I'll be an ambassador for Auckland. And volcanoes, harbour, harbour, harbour. That, that, that's a very quotable quote right there. Adrian, incredible transformation, huge projects. We'll have a much better city. Start of transformation for Auckland. Create a different kind of community. And John, our internal favourite, strong themes, great stuff happening, leveraging more, opportunities taken up, protect qualities Aucklanders value, blazing a trail, vibrant spaces. Thank you. All progress must sit on positivity. Ludo, 
uh, the masterful provoker of thoughts that you are. Thank you for a thought-provoking uh, session tonight and your hosting of that. Edith, you've made the trip to our big little city, delayed flights and all, um, and it's been an ab absolute pleasure to host you. We will indeed quote you on your ambassadorship for Auckland. Um, Adrian and John, we've needed your insights for our Auckland context here tonight. Thank you for your energy and commitment to our journey ahead. Um, elected members who are here tonight with me acknowledge you. Three of us were acknowledged there might be some more in the room. Um, my apologies if there are. And finally, to all of you here tonight, very much appreciate your time and your presence. Um, farewell to you and to our online audience who are enjoying the live streaming of tonight. If you're a sponsor and supporter of Auckland Conversations, we salute you. If you're not, and you could, and you should, um, contact us, we'd love to talk with you. Farewell everyone, have a good evening. <laughs>